everybody, it's me, John Lorden, and we're back with another episode of Case Cracked. Today we're going to be looking into Lori Erica Ruff, and this is a bit of a popular topic. I've had many people suggest it for brain scratch. However, this past week, uh, the case has been cracked. So here we are, and we're going to see how that happened. Starting in 2004, uh, at that time, her name was Lori Erica Kennedy. She meets a man named Blake Ruff, and they get married uh, with only the preacher being in attendance. And some weirdness starts to be noticed there by Blake's family. Uh, for example, I guess his mother wanted to run a notice in the paper about their marriage uh, coming up, and Lori insisted that she not do that, that it's not the type of thing that she uh, believed in. Now, there was some other strains uh, going on in the marriage. Apparently, Lori was a bit antisocial. She might leave uh, family gatherings to go take a nap and do things like that. Eventually, in 2008, they have a daughter together, and this is after trying very hard and having a few miscarriages. They actually use in vitro fertilization and successfully have a child, but Lori seems extremely overprotective about her daughter to the point where she doesn't even want family members of Blake's to hold her daughter. So this creates some tension uh, within the family. And eventually in 2010, uh, it seems like Blake is pretty much fed up with his marriage and decides to move out. He moves back in with his family. Uh, some more odd occurrences happen between Lori and the family. Uh, apparently she steals a set of their keys at some point. They are about to file a cease and desist order with her and she drives up to their house in Longview, Texas, um, pulls into the driveway and decides to kill herself there. Bit of a tragic end. And to top it all off, that is on December 24th, Christmas Eve of 2010. Now, I know that that already uh, sounds like a mystery in and of itself, but unfortunately, that is literally just the beginning. Uh, the family then drives to the home that she was living at in Leonard, Texas, and upon entering the home, they notice that it is just a complete mess. There's dirty clothes, uh, dirty dishes all over the place, shredded documents, incoherent writing, um, and they eventually find a lockbox in a closet. Apparently, um, Blake knew about this lockbox, but he knew that Lori did not want him to touch it. She said that her parents were both deceased. She had a very rough childhood. Uh, she basically burned all of her pictures of her childhood, and she just did not want to ever talk about it, and he was not to go into that lockbox. Obviously, now that she was deceased, the family decided to pop the lockbox open. They used a screwdriver to get it open, and inside of it, they find some more somewhat incoherent writings. Um, there's some papers. You can actually check the description box below and you will see some images of some of these papers. Numerous phone numbers, odd little notes that don't seem to uh, mean a lot to many people. Although they did find a lawyer's name and contact information there. Authorities reached out to the lawyer and he does not know who this person is whatsoever. But the most interesting thing that the family finds out is that Lori Erica Ruff, whose maiden name was Lori Erica Kennedy, was actually not Lori Erica Kennedy. She had changed her name and before it was Becky Sue Turner. But then through the paperwork they also discovered that Becky Sue Turner actually died in a fire at the age of two. Her death certificate's literally in this box as well. So it appears that the person that we know as Lori Erica Ruff is an identity thief that stole the identity of a child that had died and then used that to change her name to Lori Erica Kennedy and basically start a new life. Why is a huge question and quite honestly even though the case has been cracked I don't know if we can quite answer that yet but let's keep going and see what we can find here. Um, so she has a pretty much unknown past at this point. We don't know her real name. We don't even know if she is the stated age. Uh, apparently when she shot herself, uh, she was supposedly 41 years of age, but the family um, was always a little curious about her age, thinking maybe she was older because of some of the problems that they were having conceiving uh, a child. 
Um, in May of 1988, she requested the birth certificate for Becky Sue Turner from Bakersfield, California. And in June, literally the next month, she then uses that birth certificate to get a state ID with her picture on it in Idaho. The following month in July, she gets in front of a judge and asks officially for a name change and it is granted and that's when she becomes um, Lori Erica Kennedy. So she's literally known as Becky Sue Turner for only the course of a few months here uh, in the late 80s. In that same July, she asks for, uh, she applies for a new social security number and at that point um, it, that basically severs her whole history. Now she has a completely fresh identity. It's not even tied necessarily to Becky Sue Turner unless you backtrace it through the legal documents, through the name change, but this is a new clean social security number. She uses this information in 1989 to get a driver's license. She gets her GED. She enrolls in community college. She actually graduates from the University of Texas at Arlington in 1997. And apparently somewhere during all this, um, it was noted that she was possibly working as a stripper. I don't know if that was to help get her through college, um, but definitely a bit of an interesting past going on here. Now, when she killed herself, she did have two suicide notes that she had in the car with her. One was written to her husband and the other was written to her daughter that was supposed to not be opened until her daughter was 18. The family looked into both of those notes and there is no information about what her real identity is. So at this point, you have all the makings of a great internet myth and that's certainly what has happened. Um, many people have speculated trying to find the identity of this, at this point, really a Jane Doe. And uh, there are numerous people that are ruled out as this is being processed but then enters someone named Colleen Fitzpatrick, who is a nuclear physicist turned forensic genealogist. And she basically offers her help um, to an investigator, a guy that is a retired investigator for the Social Security Administration. Uh, and she comes into the picture around 2013. Now she uses a DNA sample from Lori's daughter, and she's able to manipulate that DNA in a way where she could extract Blake's DNA from it and get just a core set of what belonged specifically to Lori. She uses that information um, to trace and start finding what are seemingly remote cousins of Lori's. And through this, she bumps into a name, Michael Cassidy, that she's pretty sure is a cousin of Lori's. Now, the problem is Michael Cassidy is a fairly common name. Uh, Colleen really doesn't have any myth method to drill down to the proper one there. Uh, she is getting a lot of hits in the Pennsylvania area that seem like they could be related to her as well. And through this, after a couple years of working on this, and she says she spent literally hundreds of hours analyzing this, um, she finds what she believes is another third cousin. She builds a family tree off of that information, and in that family tree she, says, she sees the name Michael Cassidy again pop up, and now she has a bit better information to get to the correct Michael Cassidy. So she forwards that information to the retired um, uh, Social Security Administration investigator. His name is uh, Joe Velling. And Joe Velling winds up flying out to Philadelphia, finding a family member. He doesn't go right for Michael Cassidy. He finds someone else that is related to it. And even in the articles you see on this, this person kind of remains unidentified. But he s starts speaking to this family member, trying to tell them this story. Um, it's too much for the person to take. They're kind of losing interest. So he starts pulling out photos. And as soon as they see her, I think it's her driver's license, if I remember correctly, her most recent driver's license, they say, and quote, my God, that's Kimberly. Yes, she is actually Kimberly McLean, and she turns out to be the daughter of Michael Cassidy's aunt. So it looks like that DNA stuff works pretty dang well, particularly in this case. She ran away from home in 1986 after her parents got divorced and her mother got remarried. I did find one note that said she didn't get along with her stepfather. I don't know if there might have been something more to it than that. It just occurs to me personally, and this is just opinion here, that with how protective she was of her daughter, 
um, how much she wanted to run away from her previous life. Maybe there was something bad going on in the home there. I'm really not certain. But her mother is indeed still alive. She is now 80 years old, and they have done DNA tests to confirm, and it supports this story all the way through. Her mother is certainly related to uh, her granddaughter. Although it does leave a bunch of questions for her mother, um, and really no firm conclusion or way to understand uh, Lori or Kimberly McLean any better since she didn't leave uh, any information behind about what motivated her to leave home in the first place. Um, and apparently even the suicide notes that she left behind are kind of hard to understand and they seem to be somewhat incoherent as well. So a little bit of a heartbreaker, but certainly uh, an interesting way to crack a case and I'm pretty excited um, by that type of use of DNA. I mean to know that people can uh, extract you know basically the father's DNA from a sample, get some information that they know is specifically from the mother and use that to start identifying people that are cousins of this person out of the whole spectrum of the country. That's pretty amazing to me and uh, I just wish that we had a little more information about what was really going on with Lori slash Kimberly um, that made her decide that she didn't want to uh, live this life anymore, which is certainly tragic when you consider that she left behind uh, a daughter that is now coming up on eight years old, I guess, and is probably going to have many questions of her own about who is my mother. Thank you so much for joining me on another edition of Case Cracked. I hope you guys have a wonderful day, and I'll catch you on the next show on the Lord and Arts Channel.